Hi, this is Ken Jureski, and today we're talking pictures with Paul Giroux. Paul is, uh, he's run the gamut. He's worked for big newspapers, small newspapers. He's worked for magazines. He uh, has his own business. He shoots portraits. He shoots weddings. He's done everything in this business. Right now, he uh, he's shooting some video that I thought was really interesting. We're going to get... Uh, get his workflow, talk a little bit about his career and his history and see exactly what he's up to today. Hi, Paul. Hey, Ken. How's it going? It's snowing out here. <sighs> yeah, snowing. we're going to get it on Friday, I think. It's coming yeah. our way. Send it at your way. It's nice and wet and heavy. We've got about six inches of snow and uh, shut down our internet a little bit this morning. Allowed me to get my wife's steers fed because she's in the cattle business now. So oh, okay. <laughs> that's, uh, that's what's happening here. Tell me what you're working on. What I'm working on right now is, well, there's a lot of things. I'm working on a project on this high school football team locally. It's called uh, A Season with the LCATs. It's the Lake Mills LCATs. And it's a project that I first did in 2014 and 2015 when we lived in California. And I started doing that project as a way to learn how to use Sony because I literally just switched right when I was starting that video project in 2014. And it was, I, I knew I wanted to do something that was stills and video combined. And I thought there's only one way to really do something and that's to create a self-initiated project. And I was lucky enough to get the coach of the local high school team to give me access and so I just started photographing practices, summer camp, football games on Friday nights, and the locker room before, halfway through the game and after the game. And I'm doing that now with the Lake Mills team since we just moved to Wisconsin about 10 months ago. Nice. So uh, there's, nothing, there's nothing like high school football. It's, it's, it's the uh, best. It's one of the, the best sports to shoot. It's, uh, I, I was just uh, I was talking to, I, I think just Todd Bigelow last week, and we were talking about uh, how shooting high school football at night in high school stadiums, it, uh, it used to be a big challenge. And it still is to some degree, but what you're, the, the, the video you're shooting here, it looks... Uh, it looks like it's in an NFL stadium. I mean, it's just, it's the quality. It's not, paid. it's not. That's at a two fiftieth of a second. It's on one twenty frames per second. It's in a mode on the Sony a nine called S and Q. And so what that does is it processes that file directly in the camera so that when I'm reviewing the photo on my camera, I actually see it in slow motion. Now it's not quite as high of a bit rate as it would be were I to shoot it at 120 full HD, but you know, like the ability to see it in real time, well, not in real time, but after you shoot it and just review it is, it's just like watching NFL films is which, and that's what I grew up on. So I, I just love that super slow motion. I think it just makes sports even more powerful and more dramatic and that really helps. So let's go through those technical numbers again. You're at 250. At, what's your ISO? 250th of a second. Well, I think, two eight. Yeah, I think it's f2.8 with a 400 millimeter 2.8 lens, the Sony G Master. And then I think my ISO was about 3200. 3200. So that's yeah. Uh, that's pretty reasonable with that that body sure. actually. Yeah. And if I were shooting stills, I'd have to be up quite a bit higher. I'd probably have to be up to. 64, well, probably up to 12, eight, 12,800 because I need a higher shutter speed to stop action in stills. So it does give me some flexibility with the uh, frame rate bringing the ISO down. So it, it, it's, it's one of those things about shooting video that's different and you kind of have to get your head wrapped around it if you come from a still background. So just to, just to translate that amount of light, okay. that's like... Uh... Uh, in still photography terms, that's dark. That, that's it's pretty dark. I mean, it's, and it's a kind of stadium that has some flickering. So, uh, 
so but it didn't show up at that shutter speed with the video so what's your frame rate just so like I, I, 120 I, frames per second so you're cutting your your shutter speed in half yeah the, yeah. the, you know the 180 shutter rule that they call it in, in video and so and you, you you saw no flicker even with the uh like that. nice that's that's literally right out of the camera i copy a proxy file so it's a slightly smaller file uh-huh and then i can send that proxy file from my camera to my phone using the imaging edge app which is a sony app and it's a free app. And the beauty of that is it can go from the camera to the phone. And then in the phone, I can trim it in just the, the photos app of the iPhone. Oh, so a, Adobe Rush or Premiere Rush or whatever that's called? Well, I used, I used Rush after I made the initial cuts because I knew I just wanted like a, what was that, about a seven second clip or 50, maybe a little bit longer. But I put the titles in Rush, Adobe okay. Rush. Right. So okay. it's, you know, if you're still on, the, on your phone, you're still on your phone. Yep, I'm still on my phone. So it's called couch editing. <laughs> well, it's called sideline editing. <laughs> yeah, that too. But I didn't do it at the sideline, but I, I could, I could have. So what's your, what's your total? Like, so I think this, I'm going to show this clip. I think it's 30 seconds or so. What's, what's your post-production time on this single 30 second clip? just to get an idea. Oh gosh, I think it probably took me, if you'd put everything together, it's gonna take you about no more than five to 10 minutes. I was gonna say it's like under 10 minutes. And yeah, that's, yeah. That's incredible in itself to yeah. have a 30 second uh, piece done in 10 minutes on your phone and you're sharing it with the world, basically. It's pretty cool. I yeah. mean, I would have killed for this 30 years ago when we were trying to get photos out of Haiti. Oh yeah, remember how that was? Oh, what a how nightmare. did how what, so you were okay? So oh. we went to Haiti a few times together. Yeah, and um, what uh, you were shooting for the Chicago Tribune? Yeah, I was. And you were shooting color negative film and black and white. The first wow. trip was a lot of black and white and some chrome, which was shipped back or carried back. Right. And the color black, the color negative and the black and white we processed in the hotels. I mean, did you travel with a dark room? Did you rely no. on the AP staffer? What'd you do? I used AFP. I think AFP. Reuters, Reuters, Bob Strong helped me out. Right. Quite a few times. And um, the AP did. I'm trying to think. Of, Dave Tannenbaum, I think, was down there from AP back in the day. And they would bring the dark rooms. And then typically they'd soup your film and make prints at first and then later on in a couple of years it was scanning film sure because that was right at that time leafax was coming out right but at that at that so at, the, at this point let me just go through okay so we completely got sidetracked here. <laughs> yeah and that never happens when we get together yeah that's why that's why we have this like free-flowing uh format on talking pictures because we really never know where it's going to go. So let me just go through the workflow because it's, it's interesting and um, it's no longer exists, but uh, so you would shoot color neg film, black and white film, the wire services down there, you're with the Chicago Tribune. So the wire services as uh, you know, you're a member of the AP as the Chicago Tribune your subscriber to Reuters or AFP. And so they kind of, uh, they have to serve the staffers. Uh, right. So, so the AP photographer would travel with a dark room, the AFP, the Roy, they'd all travel with dark rooms and they'd set up in their bathroom, in their hotel room. And then the staff photographers for the various newspapers would process their film with them. And then, they'd actually make prints at this point. Yes. And so tell me about uh, how many color projects. Uh, so uh, uh, to, to tell me how, how you got a color print image to your newspaper in Chicago. The, the print would be made with a Kodak Ektaflex machine. Do you remember that? So it's like a big eight by 10 Polaroid basically. Right. It's, 
Never and quite was, worked right. <laughs> it was it was very Tinker Toys, and remember that in larger was the Fujimoto, which right. was which was portable and small. And of course, can you imagine traveling with that chemistry now? There's no way. No. No way. And we would process the film. God knows where it went after it was sent down the the toilet or the drain. And we'd make these prints and then we'd slap a, a caption on it that was typewritten. So you'd, and, you'd make a physical <laughs> color print. Physical print, yeah. You had a big... Uh, a, a label, basically a big label that you would type on, peel the back off, and stick it onto the print. As well as color bars. Color bars, and, right. And registration marks. Right. So that the, the engravers could actually put those separations together in the back in the back of the newspaper. So a black and white image took Piece eight minutes. Eight minutes. To well, you got to remember in international speed, there was AP domestic, AP foreign, UPI domestic, UPI foreign. That was always twice as long as a domestic signal because the phone lines were so awful that they had to go slower. So a color project took 30 minutes with a foreign transmission and a black and white took about 15. Normally it would take about eight on a domestic Right. So eight minutes to send one black and white in America, 15 to send it from Haiti, and 30 minutes to send it from a color photo over the phone line into the U.S. from Haiti. That was assuming that nobody picked up the phone and screwed up the transmission by putting out a line hit, which was basically meant you had to start all over again. So just say that again. I think I, I think your audio, speaking of line oh. hits, I think we just got one. Got one. Okay. So the eight minutes was to send the black and white photo from in the States, 15 oh, but, minutes to send it from there. Right. But the, the color project, you had to send that same color print three times. Correct. And so 30 minutes, 10 minutes each. Yeah. Right. And then the engravers in the back of the newspaper would take those and they'd be shot through a different filter by the scanner. And then they'd put them back together as a uh, separation in the back room of the newspaper. And that's how color images went from anywhere in the U S overseas, anywhere uh, at that time, the late, the AP laser photo that it was uh and like, like you said, it, uh, you get one hit on one of those transmissions, you'd have to send that, that color, you know, magenta, whatever, cyan, again. So it was, it was uh, frustrating, to say the least. What I would give to have even one-tenth of all those hours spent sitting, listening to AP Domestic or AP Foreign or a Leafax later on, just... Wait watching for... grass grow, yeah. watching paint dry. That's why oh. I always envied the magazine guys because they, they would just basically go and shoot and ship their film and they wouldn't have to deal with any of that post-production. But newspapers, we had to. Right. So I feel bad for the wire guys. They had the worst because not only did they have to make an early deadline, then they had to take care of us. Yeah, they had to get a picture out. Uh, they probably, like the AP, probably at that time had probably like 12 or 15 afternoon newspapers across the entire country. But they had to serve them. So they'd have to go out, make a picture, get those in by 10 in the morning, say Haiti time. And um, then they, then all the other newspaper photographers would come in looking, looking to get their, their film souped and, and printed and whatnot. Meanwhile, us magazine photographers, we'd get a box and, you know, somebody would be a, elected to go to the airport and ship our film to New York. And, and that's, that was our workflow, pretty simple in comparison. Or remember when we used to give film to passengers on airplanes yeah. <laughs> and ask them to, here, take this film yeah. to Miami. And when you get to Miami, Here's a card of this person to call, and here's hundred bucks. 
<laughs> Can you imagine that? It would never happen now. It'd be, TSA no. would go crazy. No, you'd, people, you'd, be, yeah. you'd be thrown in the slammer for just even suggesting giving somebody yeah. a package today. It's changed so much. No, that was, uh, so, so to put this all, to, to complete the circle, yes. at this point, you can actually have a video out and sharing it with the world um, in under 10 minutes. Yep. Whereas to get a color picture out in the past, it would, you know, it was basically impossible. to. to <laughs> and that was just going to your newspaper then to be printed on the press, to be distributed on the steps by a carrier in the morning. So it wouldn't even be seen until the next day. Yeah, that kind of blows your mind. Are we, are, I mean, are we better off today with the instantaneous type of thing? Well, that's always a, the source of a debate. But quite frankly, I wish I would have had this technology back then. It would have just made my life so much easier. But now, by virtue of the fact that I did go through that, I can really appreciate what I've got right now. And so when I talk to somebody about being able to send a photo from the literally at 2000 feet in a balloon and put it on Instagram just because you can. That's pretty cool because I know what it used to be like. We right. have a point of reference that other people don't have. Not to say it's better or worse, but I'm just like, wow, look at where we were and look at where we've come. And frankly, I just think that what we've got now has never been better in terms of the tools. I have no desire to go back to any of that old tech. Oh, and no. If, yeah. It's so funny because film is so romantic by a lot of younger photographers and that's okay because they didn't have to do what we had to do with it. For us, that was our Sony A9 Mark II was a roll of 400 Fuji and a lab. Yeah, I'll tell you, I, I mean, I have no desire to ever, ever shoot a roll of film again. I, I just, zero, zero desire. I just love the ability to sit and see a photograph and know right away that I've got it. Like I know a lot of wedding photographers because I'm in that wedding space. Now, a lot of them like to shoot on medium format or even 35 millimeter film. And I think, well, if they want to do that, that's fine. But boy, that's sure going to eat into your profit margins because it's a dollar a click basically. But the other thing is, is that look is definitely, I can see a difference. I mean, I can see when Triax is there or medium format has been shot. It looks great, but is it something that many people will notice? I don't know, but I don't. I just don't want to work like that anymore. It's been I've been there, done that, got the T-shirt, <laughs> got the T-shirt, <laughs> sold to us by Larry Downey. <laughs> Blast from the past. Yeah. Um, so let me let me pull up this video because I want to. Uh, it always takes me a second to uh first let me pull it up here sorry so this is the video and it's just like oh it's 39 seconds and i don't think there's any sound so we can talk no there's no sound so you, you mentioned NFL films and how that's kind of a inspiration. And I think, uh, I think there's certainly that quality and I don't think NFL films could have shot this, uh, back in the day under this type of light. There's like nothing there, which is it. I mean, really your whites aren't blown out. I know. Did you, did you, that's, that's just the way it was. That's the way I captured it. It wasn't even manipulated at all in post. So you didn't grade this at all? No. Nope. This is straight out of, this is basically straight out of camera. Yeah. Wow. Okay, let's take a look. So you're shooting with the 4028, right? 50th of a second. Frame rate about 125 per second. 120 120 frames per second. Yeah, 120 frames per second. And are you pulling focus here? How, how are you? All autofocus. Wow. And it's not even IAF. 
like the new A92 has. Where where is it? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just play that again so we can watch the focus point. So there's, you, there's a point where it pops out at the catch, but then it re, regroups it really quickly. So where... I've got a focus point that's pretty much in the center, and I'm just moving it. You're moving it just with the camera or with the, the thumb? I'm just... I'm just uh, if I have to, I move it with my thumb, but I didn't even move it. I didn't have time on this one. It's pretty right. much in the center. Wow, that's nice. And so this, I see that it didn't uh, didn't follow on number one. That see, that's the smart thing about Sony. Want. Yeah. So it's it's it, once it's locked on the guy that it thinks you, that that the the other player coming in front of you, it's not gonna it's not gonna pick that up. Yeah, I I'd have to double check if that was if it's got the kind of the smart fancy autofocus with this system. Uh, the new A9 Mark II has even better audio focus with video, and it's faster. Like Pat Murphy Racy, a friend of ours, he has tested the camera, and he says that the focus is more precise. It grabs faster. It locks on. It doesn't move. And so he's noticed a real difference in just stills. And so I expect it to be the same with video, only, be, you know, like what we saw there with the A9 original and then going to the next one that's that's the thing about the sony stuff it always gets not just it's not just like marginally better it's always significantly better whether it's color science or focus uh, ease better predictability and for me like it's a no-brainer to upgrade to the a92 because of the eye auto focus in video now it wouldn't play much of a role in photography of football probably for video but it could but it's just one of those things that's like I, I know a lot of videographers say well I have to have a 4k 60p 10-bit frame 10-bit uh, file codec and I understand why they want it for grading and then they can use the cameras for Netflix and stuff like that and the thing is is I'm not doing that I'm not doing a Netflix show I'm doing things that are going to be shown at full age. I would much rather have the autofocus capabilities that this affords me than contrast-based autofocus like you'll find in those cameras that do have those frame rates. Or I should say the codec that they're looking for. How, how old's the, a, the, the original A9 now? The A9 came out in 2016, so it's probably been since 2015 or so what, that they've been designing it, maybe even 2014. Who knows, maybe even earlier. The things that used to take 10 years then took five years, and now they, they take 18 months. Yeah. So, to, so the A7R three came out not even two years ago. Well, about two years ago now. So they released the A7R four I think, at about 20 months or 21 months since the A7R three came out. And a lot of people say, oh, gosh, they keep coming out with new cameras so fast I can't keep up. And I say, yeah, I understand. I would much rather be spoiled for choice than to not have that option or to have just marginally incremental upgrades from camera to camera. The thing that I've really noticed it in is uh, the lens design and production. I mean, that's really, uh, to me, it's, it's, it's they've just, uh, I, I guess they're doing computer modeling on these lens designs and they can, they don't have to build 20 different models before they can actually have a finished uh, model yeah. ready to produce. So it's incredible. Yeah, the, the whole production cycle has shortened considerably. But it, it, it's, all, it's all great to talk the specs and all that. But to me, it's never been about that. It's always been, what can this camera let me do that I couldn't do before? And how can I up my game? Like when we switched to EOS back in 1987, we switched because we saw the advantages to autofocus. Even though we were both pretty good at manual focus, look, I'm not too proud to beg. I will take autofocus if it's better than me. Not I'll, everybody I'll can be yeah. Andy Haight. No, exactly. Andy, Andy was one, one, in a, one of a kind, uh, uh, still is. Um, the, uh, this idea that 
technology is there for for you to take advantage of and not to uh not to be the other way around um do you think you think we get caught up as as you know the geek sure. side of the photographer sure. world i mean oh, yeah i mean that's the thing that I don't know. I just, I, I've always been intr intrigued by this kind of merging of science and technology and art. Pho photography has it like nobody else. And there's an immediacy to it. I mean, I grew up wanting to be a draw, uh, cartoonist and artist and that was great, but photography was what grabbed me. And it was because of seeing the technology. Like when you look at a tray of developing, I know everybody, talks about that first moment when you see a print pop up and it's true for me probably for you too it's true for me it was magic and it was like whoa i have to do this and there was no doubt about it that it was magic and it's what i wanted to do and it's still it's still that way i mean i love looking at prints when they arrive and i still love to hold one and when you print on an epson printer or a canon printer and pull that print out or watch it come out it's still somewhat like that sensation of when you looked at a print in a tray in the dark room well what do you i mean it's interesting that photographers they're um if you're working as a photojournalist you've got your feet in two different worlds you're you got the the reporter side and the photographer side but as a photographer in general you're you're still in two different worlds. You're you on one side, you're you're an artist, you're creative. On the other side, you are this geek that just kind of loves technology and loves talking about the numbers to a certain degree. Do you, I mean it's a kind of a common thing? I don't see that in any. I, I mean, a jazz musician won't be talking about the next saxophone coming out i don't think maybe they do i don't know see that's the thing is we're pretty we're pretty deep in the weeds of our business and we've been in it for a long time and who's to say that maybe cinematographers don't talk the same nuts and bolts that we do or maybe maybe painters talk about types of paint that are very different we wouldn't know from adam but you know, there might be that world that they live in. I don't know. I just know that this is the world that I inhabit and it's kind of feels like a perfect fit for me. It's always evolving. It's always changing. And it's, but in the end, it's still about making a photograph that you really, really want to look at, as you said one time. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's, that's what gets you, uh, might not get you out of bed in the morning, but it'll get you back behind that camera in the afternoon. I mean, you know, it's funny because whenever I was in newspapers and, you know, of course, when you're in any kind of a corporate environment, you deal with the politics of any place. And the best part about it was getting an assignment that pulled me out of the office to go meet people. And once you were in that environment with those people, you just focused on what you had to do and being with these folks and making a great photograph. And it took you away from all of the drama and all of the BS that you used to have. And that, that was one of the things that kept me around newspapers for so long was because of that connection with the community at large, but also the fact that it was varied. It was sports one day, portraits the next, documentary stories the third day, you know, helping somebody edit a photo essay the next, you know, everything was all within that kind of that same theme, but slightly different techniques and it was up to us to master them. We had to be good at a lot of different things because if you weren't, you weren't going to last. No. And that's, uh, that's something that it's, it's, it's kind of, I don't know if it's completely lost these days, but this idea that um, as a newspaper photographer, you covered a com community so, so closely that you, and you were a part of that community. It was, it was, it was it was kind of the best job in the world you know you knew you knew you knew the crooks you knew the cops you knew the politicians you knew uh how to uh how to get anybody on the phone and who you should talk to 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 get access somewhere it was it was your own personal playground having that at a newspaper and you did have to have all those skills to to be able to 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 meet the newspaper paper's needs you know 
Well, the other skills too were the people skills that you the developed. Skills. You had to develop them because if you didn't have that, people won't let you into their world. And that's, that's one of the neatest things about it, that people would actually open up their homes to you and they'd let you re- see a, a, you know, the side of their lives. At the end of my career in newspapers, I just got tired of being there on bad days for people. And I just wanted to be around for good days. And maybe that's wrong, but I just knew that I'd kind of, it was time to move on. Yeah, so that's, that's another great point you bring up, this, uh, the people skills. And the successful newspaper photographers, the ones that uh, that just create lasting uh, this lasting body of work, um, they all have great people skills. And you have that. I don't. I'm not. I'm not great at that. I don't really like people that much. I just you know they uh, they drive me crazy, but. But you you have this this ability to um, find something in everybody. You, you're kind of like a optimist, I think. <laughs> but, some days, you know, some days. I I'd like to think I'm pretty optimistic, but you never know. Some days you have days when you're kind of down. But I just feel like if I can focus on them, I don't worry about me as much. Yeah, that's the that's that's the, that's the key, you know. Um, and I, I use the, the Avedon example all the time. It's Avedon, everybody was shooting, every portrait he ever made was just a self-portrait and it was always about him. And that, you know, he made great images, but it was always about him uh, shooting a self-portrait, something about himself. The newspaper photographer, if you think about it, um, you, you know, you, you talk about seeing people on their good days, seeing people on their bad days. Um, say like when I was working, I'd, I'd do jobs for People Magazine, and I'd I'd always have to remind myself that yeah, I'll get another byline, and I'll have a byline next week, and I'll get a byline the month after that, whatever. But this might be the only time these people ever end up in People Magazine or their local newspaper, and they're going to cut that out. It's going to end up on the refrigerator. Then it's going to end up in a scrapbook someplace and they'll pull it out when people come over to their house to visit. It's an important thing. And as long as you always keep that in mind as not necessarily as a photographer, but as a photojournalist, it's not about you and you it's, it's, it's about them. I think that then you're on, on the right track to making, making good images. I, I always felt like if people let you in, they would reveal themselves to you in ways that you could never set up. And I would always be like amazed at what would happen in front of my lens or the things that people would tell me. And yeah. it, it, it just was surprising to me. And I feel like that was one of the greatest gifts about the photography was just to be a witness to it. The photos sometimes were great and sometimes they were just good. Sometimes they were just did the job, but you know, it was always it was a real interesting experience to be in people's lives like that, sometimes three times a day. And now when I photograph people's families, it has more meaning as I've gotten older. And now that I have my own kids and have been married for almost 18 years and you look back on it, it's like, Oh man, this is legacy stuff. It's a a tremendous responsibility. Yeah. That's why I think portraiture and wedding photography has been so maligned. I mean, I was, I was the Saul of Tarsus about wedding photography when I was a news photographer. I, was, I would torture them because it was like so beneath me as a photojournalist. And it's like, oh, God, you got to be careful for who you torture because then you'll become that. And I became a wedding photographer because I thought, well, every, everything that we always wanted in news photography, you found it in weddings. And people actually didn't put up a police tape to keep you away. They wanted you there. And when I realized that, I was like, well, I don't care what people in the industry think about what I do. It's about the work that I'm, you know, I've got to follow what's right for me. And portraiture is that way too. Now I'm trying to do something different with my photography, my portraiture, and trying to do something that's more um, like documentary based, storytelling based, rather than just the kind of the posed portraiture though that's what a lot of people want but i 
I, I, I still think that there's a place for that kind of documentary storytelling about people's families. And so that's what I'm going to be attempting to do. And that's why I do this football project, because it gives me practice in that. It gives me practice in knowing people and being around them, shooting stills and videos together, because I think that's going to be my future, even more than stills only. And not just video either. I, I think there's power in both. And I, I feel like this is the perfect system to allow me to do both of those things. Do you... <laughs> Do you get exhausted just by shooting pictures? Not when I'm not talking like running up inside down the sidelines of a football game, but just when you're shooting portraits and because of this, you're trying to, you're trying to get beyond just the visual and really you only have the visual to work with as a photographer, but you're trying to get beyond that. I find it exhausting and it's mentally exhausting. And I, I think it has to do with um, that, that, uh, I don't know, there's a, re, there's a, there's a burden there a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, although it, it's funny because I feel less tired now as the tools have evolved and are less, you know, like I see it in real time, what I'm getting, like, I know I have less. Re, remember those days when we shot film and you're like, Oh God, I hope I got it because you didn't know until it was processed. At least now you can know if you've got something or if you need to go back and try it again. Or, you know, like I, I feel like sometimes just the, the, and the sheer technical, like making sure your focus point was on the eye and is your aperture gonna be deep enough to keep that eye in focus. I find that those are those kind of concerns have kind of, which kind of wore on me when I was shooting like at a wedding, for example, now I don't even think about it. I, I actually love that fact that I'm going to be there for eight to 12 hours and it's just going to unfold right in front of my eyes. I don't know exactly how it's going to be, but I know that whatever I see, I'll be able to photograph it and record it and not worry about it, knowing that I can shoot at F1.4 and nail it on the eye. I mean, that is such a humongous strain off of my psyche, you know, like, People don't, I don't think people realize what it, what you worry about when you think you have something and you come back and you see the film process and you just were off of focus. I remember one, one time I came back from a Notre Dame, Michigan state game and there was a big play in the fourth quarter and it was an interception. And I thought for sure, Oh, I got it. And I came in confident and cocky as a 23 year old kid and said, yeah, I got Ouch. it. Oh boy. I didn't, I had it. I framed it, but I wasn't sharp. Right. And that was a hell of a lesson in swallowing your pride. Yeah. Yeah. You don't, you don't want to, you don't want to brag until you actually put a loop on something. <laughs> the old, <laughs> still want to hold it down a little bit. The old guys used to say, let your pictures lead you into the room. You know, that, you know, let them tell your story, let them talk for you. Right. Right. And that's one, th I mean, that's probably just the generation that we're from. And it's hard because when you're a self, when you're a small businessman as a photographer, you have to kind of do a little bit of self-promotion, right? even if it's very subtle, but you still have to do it. And as a news photographer, that was the thing that you did not do. You let your photos talk. But part of it was because the people in the room who looked at the photos knew how to tell them. They could tell, the, they, they could tell if they were there. If you know you're blowing smoke, you know. You said something interesting um, about how you can you can never predict or imagine the things that'll happen in front of your camera, and I tell that to people, and I say, you know, when you think about when you get a preconceived idea, or you or you think, oh, I'll just I'll just have this person do this and this person do that, and you set up an image, especially as a as a photojournalist. Not only is that taboo, but what it really does, it limits what's going to happen. And your imagination is never going to be more uh, creative than what really happens. And if you well, just it, it. It's, it's so true. At least that's what was true for me. But I know people in the wedding industry come from a different mindset. They're not being fired if they make the same, make a photo up or create one. And, you know, like I'm not saying that that's bad or wrong whatever works for people. But like I've shown photos, to, I remember showing my, an album, a wedding album from a 
wedding on on at Poe Monkey's Juke Joint down in Marigold, Mississippi. And I mean, it, that's the place where Annie Leibovitz went, Allard went when they sure. did their blues stories. Sure. I'm like, I'm shooting a wedding there. And I was like pinching myself because it felt like I was doing a geographic story, even though it was a wedding. And I showed an album to a photographer who was probably more from the conventional photo background in the wedding space. And he looked at that album and he said, oh my gosh, those photos are so real. And I've had another photographer friend of mine uh, who comes from a background show his photos to somebody from a wedding that was all documentary wedding photography. And the guy says, I don't see that. And I can't be sure that I would capture that. And I think we take it for granted because we had to learn that if we didn't innately have it, we had to see it. We couldn't put our hands on something unless it was a portrait. So to, you know, photographically speaking. And so we had to develop that skill of being a witness and kind of anticipating what happened, be ready for what might happen, but also what may totally take us by surprise. And that's, I think the, the real that's the real skill that we bring to the table that we kind of take for granted. And it was some, sometimes it was kind of like diminished by some of the newspaper people that were your bosses because they thought, you know, if they get in their head that they're pretty good, they might uh, want more. You know what I mean? No. And, and, and there's also that there's that, uh, you know, in the journalism business, there's a certain amount of cynicism, and like you said, even even I, at one point you you look down on wedding photographers, but the flip side of that is if you are shooting for the geographic, and you are in the in the the rural Mississippi, you're gonna be you're gonna be you're gonna be finding a wedding <laughs> to shoot as a national geographic. If you're doing a portrait of that that community, you want to be at that wedding. But now all of a sudden it's more important because, you know, you're shooting for National Geographic as opposed to actually making pictures for the people who are, who are celebrating. You know, it's, it's funny that you mentioned that because Vince Musi, our friend, uh, told us one time when he started working for the Ge- Geographic, one of the things that they would tell you to do is find a wedding when you got to town. And That's it's no like, hanging fruit. It is. It's a visually loaded situation. And it's a great way to and become well to it and you know it's, there's a reason it's been going on for centuries there's there's a rite of passage there it's a, a mating ritual really and a society ritual that's really fascinating to me like i go to the the receptions and i'm 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 fascinated by them i think they're just some of the most amazing things to witness because you couple that celebration with youth and alcohol and music and it, it's I mean I look at it now and I'm seeing photos that I could have could not have made before and camera is shooting in the virtual dark finding an eyeball of the person I'm photographing and I'm thinking oh wow this stuff is so cool <clears throat> but as a journalist how smart is it if you you're coming into a small community you go to a wedding and if you're there for the next week, the next two weeks, you know everybody. At that point, you're one of the community. After going to that wedding, you're welcome into everybody's home after that. And a sporting event is the same kind of thing. I mean, it's like, it's like the warriors of the town. And football is the top of the food chain for that, I think. Yeah. And being in the Midwest, sports is something that people – live, breathe, eat. It's a part of who they are. I mean, I was driving to a game last week and I drove past a woman as she was out raking the lawn and she had a Wisconsin jacket on. And it was one of those things that, you know, it seems kind of small and maybe insignificant, but I thought she may have gone to Madison. She may have gone 40 years ago, but she's still wearing the colors of that school as she's out it's like people take great pride in that they live for the green and gold of the packers here and i think it's it's just it's a cultural phenomenon and it just fits so 
perfectly for where we've come from as photojournalists because I'm like documenting this small town life. And when I was a kid, all I wanted to do was get the hell out of small town life and see the world. And I did, and I'm glad I did. I have no regrets, but I'm so glad I'm back to this. I'm really glad. You know, it's, it's a tribal thing. And it's so, you know, you, it starts at say the high school level or maybe younger than that. And in high school, it's like, oh, I'm from, I'm from Bryan, South Omaha, you know, and those guys from Burke, they're all rich. And, and then you get it up to the next level. Well, we're all Nebraska fans. And it's, it's a tribal thing that doesn't have any real dire consequences. You can yeah. still have, you can still tailgate. If you're from Nebraska, you can tailgate with people from Oklahoma or Wisconsin. And everybody is, is pretty cool with that. Yeah. That's, 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 it's so it's, it's, it's a tribalism that doesn't have any real dire consequences that everybody can engage in, in a safe and kind of, uh, uh, civilized manner. for the most part unless you're in certain neighborhoods after the bulls won the nba finals <laughs> well yeah i mean you don't you don't want to you know you don't want to be walking around green bay with your uh <laughs> bears jersey, bears jersey. <laughs> <laughs> the Ditka mustache after after a long well, you could but yeah you might not go so well but no they're they're pretty cool anyway though i it's 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 been a it's been refreshing to come back to the Midwest. There's something different about it over the coast, and I've lived on both coasts and in a big city in the Midwest when I started in Chicago. And every step of the way was really an important part of the process. And I never thought I would come back, but I got to say that all of that stuff that I did in each of those places was really important to learn, whether it was learning how to deal with pol political people for those five years in DC, learning how to um, do all the technical stuff with transmitting and, you know, digital cameras when I was in Arizona and dealing with a smaller market, but still a fairly big market. And then in California it was learning how to be a self-employed photographer while still being true to those things that we kind of hold dear. And then coming back here, for many reasons, primarily family, and just kind of a, a desire to come back to something a little simpler. And yet still having all that experience behind me, it just gives me a lot of confidence. But also, you know, I, 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 I'm living in the world a lot differently than I did when I was 25, as I'm sure you are too. I mean, for one, you think you'll live forever, and, and two, you think you know it all, and I sure did. And I just, I'm, I'm glad I'm still here doing this for a living, but I'm glad I've had all those experiences along the way. And it, it just, what's, what do they say? What's, what's past is prologue and it's so true. So putting technology aside, um, if you, how much better are you do you consider yourself a better photographer today? And, and how much better are you than that, that 24 year old kid running around Washington, DC for the Chicago Tribune? Well, I, I think I'm better because now I'm, I, I remember there was a line, Sam, not a line, a, a quote that Sam Abel said, and I, you might remember it too. He said, I know when I'm in the presence of a photograph and I didn't quite get that, but now I do. It's like I walk into any room and I can, tell where my photo is going to be and where the light is and what lens I need. And it's just so second nature. And that is such a gift. And that's a gift from newspapers because of doing it so many times because that younger photographer had a lot more stamina to work three to four assignments a day for 12 to 18 hours, whatever it took. But now I'm benefiting from all of that experience in terms of like knowing how to cut to the head of the line to be to know where to be to make a photo that I know is going to deliver the goods, but then also be open to anything else that happens along the way and be ready for it. Just because you've seen things so many times. I mean, Groundhog Day is a really wonderful movie because it kind of reminds me of being a wedding photographer. You know, the arc of the day was very similar, but 
what happened for him was he began to appreciate the people along the way. And I think that's one of the things when I was younger, I was always trying to do it to, you know, I had my own agenda and now it's a little bit more, the photography is not quite the focus of it because it's so much a part of my unconscious, if that makes any sense. I, I'm not thinking about it. I have more chances to be with people because I'm not worrying about the technical stuff so much. How what would you tell your 24 year old self? Hmm. Anything? Yeah, I'm thinking. I mean, I probably it's a long, it's a long haul. <laughs> and and that's good because it's a marathon, not a sprint. And try to remember who got you to where you are and don't discount them. Even if it's not in the industry, there's people that brought you to where you are. They're worth remembering. Okay. So I don't, this might not be, I mean, you've, you've, uh, you've done a lot of big stories, but maybe like the Ron Contra hearings were, were, was one of your biggest uh, stories. I mean, it took a year or so. Um, how would you approach that today? Do you think? I think I would look at it now differently because I would have a much, much stronger context of it. Cause like I see st- see what's happening in Washington right now and I see how it's being covered and I, and I can relate back to what it was back then. And I see how it's contrasted from then versus now in terms of like how just dysfunctional media is in general and how newspapers have kind of gone. They, they're not the powerhouses that they once were. The networks aren't what they once were. It's changed so much. And, and plus I have a, just a much different sense of history that I have now that I didn't have then. And I think it, when you have more of a sense of the history, that's what, that's why it's kind of a shame that older photographers are out of newspapers now, because those were the people who have some like, you know, they have some, some time in the field. They've seen how the world works and they see how things happen. And I think they have a perspective that's valid valuable but it's sometimes about corporations because they see that as a line on a balance sheet that's going to cost them more money in healthcare as they turn 50 and it's too bad but they've kind of like i i was lucky the guys who helped me were 20 years older than me and they gave me some real real seasoning that i didn't have i had a lot of energy and i had a lot of sheer work, you know, ethic, but those guys gave me perspective and, you know, maybe you don't hear it quite the same way when you're 24 as you do when you're 35. But I think it's important to still have those voices in your ear telling you what, Hey, that's not cool. You can't do it like that. This is what you need to do. No, I mean, and I don't, I I hesitate to even mention any names because I'll forget somebody. I won't mention somebody, but if you think about the guys that were running around with us, I mean, George Thames was still, Oh gosh. Yeah. Appearance. Uh, Bernie Boston was your main competition kind of right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Harry Hamburg. God rest his soul. <laughs> yeah. Um, these guys, uh, they were, they were just uh, treasure troves of they knowledge. Were. They were, and they, sh- they all shared it too. I know. I mean, I know. I mean, what George, you know, like when you think back to the photos that George Thames made of like the world's hardest job and his LBJ series, you know, strong arming somebody in one of the Senate chambers. Oh, I mean, gosh, they were just unbelievable photographs that probably wouldn't happen. Or Jim Atherton's photos of the, the hearings in Washington. And I mean, the most mind numbing stuff you can imagine either by design or just by chance, but Jim would always make a photograph and then how he passed that on to Crowley. Right. And, and, and then plus you got Steve's aesthetic too. And what he saw. And I mean, it's just a shame because those, that access is gone. 
those people that just that world of just being that one person in their room or the two people in the room is so rare these days. It's just not happening unless you're the official photographer. Well, I mean, with, with Jim Atherton was Washington post photographer who he, his beat was Capitol Hill. I don't think he ever left. I mean, I don't, I, I don't know if he did or not, but he was the guy who knew everybody on Capitol Hill. It was his community. He knew which doors to open, which doors he could get through. He and, was the mayor. I mean, that guy, yeah. you know, he was like the guy and, and Dorica was that way too in a, in a different way because a different style and he had a different community to serve but people knew that jim was shooting for the post and that was the paper that everybody saw every day and he had i think he had a special he had a there was almost like a special pass for jim and also the fact that he shot black and white gave him some flexibility and freedom that the color shooters did not have because Jim knew how to make everything come out of that black and white negative. That yeah. guy was masterful of light. Yeah. No, it's, I mean, it's amazing. Amazing. And then we don't have that. Uh, people don't get the same opportunity to really uh, become experts at a certain subject or community, whatever. You, you know who I think might be the closest to that right now is probably Doug, Doug Mills covering the white house. Yeah. To a certain degree. I mean, he does other things like I mean, he'll probably do the Olympics, but I mean, I, I think he's probably doing some really striking photographs as well. Yeah. I mean, he's doing, he's doing good work, but he does. I mean, George Thames could literally not just like figuratively, he could literally walk into the oval office yep. anytime he wanted to. Yeah. That those days are gone. I think, I, I mean, I think, uh, you know, we, we kind of, you and I kind of both missed that. I, I, you know, pull another name up. Artie Grace talks about uh, getting special access to Jimmy Carter at one point. And it was during Iran-Contra, not, not Iran-Contra, it was during the Iranian hostage crisis. Um, right. Um, and he walked into the Oval Office, you know, he made, he made a pitch, he needed to get a picture, and he walked into the Oval Office, and Jimmy Carter had his sleeves rolled up, and he's got all these uh, papers, reports, files on his desk, and he's going through them all himself as, as you know, the Commander-in-Chief, and he's trying to, like, figure out what to do with these, the, the hostage situation. And it was a true image. It was an important image. And, it, you know, that's a direct contradiction to, you know, Reagan's who would, who would uh, uh, you know, diversify and, you know, delegate. But the image backfired on, and, I, and it just, and that was kind of the end right there because it made him look, some people perceived the image as, you know, made him look, uncomfortable or out of control or, or, or overwhelmed being, uh, overwhelmed right and so then you know we got the the reagan white house which knew i mean coming from hollywood they knew diva how, yeah yeah they knew how to, to to process and control the image to get their message out and you talk about you know lyndon johnson george thames and it's Images that you never, they'd never let you make today because they're all so media savvy. And it's, it's, I mean, Crowley, Crowley did a good job. You know, he, he, he could get into the room still and he would make a picture. Um, but man, it's, I miss those, I miss those days. Yeah. Well, they're going to live in books, unfortunately. We won't be shooting them, but at least, that's what we aspired to do. And I think we can do that in our own way, in our own little, it's not going to be something that's seen by millions maybe, but it's going to be seen by the people that it means something to. You know, it, it, 
it's funny when they, I'm thinking about uh, that press conference that uh, a joint press conference with, or it was a statement with Pelosi and Schumer. And um, was it Schumer? Um, yeah. And they tried to set it up and they didn't pull it off. And when you, when you fail at setting up an image to, to set a certain tone or make a certain statement, it, uh, it, it, when you fail at that, it really backfires in a major way. And that, that, I'm seeing more of that nowadays when they're trying to control the visual message and they don't have a real good handle on how to do that. And you started to see that even uh, with the Clinton White House. Um, they didn't have that same talent that, uh, that the Hollywood folks did. And, you know, they're hiring people from Hollywood, but it's not the same. It's not the, Reagan, uh, they, they set the high watermark on that. They could pull it off. But, uh, well, it was one of the reasons why I wanted to leave there because I didn't want to leave a legacy of photographs that were just people at microphones behind red velvet ropes. And I also felt like I was basically being used for whomever to promote whatever they wanted their agenda to be. And I actually felt like if I went back to a newspaper and I went to Arizona after that, which was so random, but it was so good. Um, at least I was going to be the only person there or a very small crew or, you know what I mean? Small presence. And I just wanted that because I just felt like it was, I was just being part of a big engine of PR when I was in DC. Now Washington, I, I don't know how they do it. I really don't. I, I, I couldn't, I couldn't, I mean, I just, I, I, I felt used all the time. LA reminded me of the same vibe because it's a one horse town and it's all about image and it's about how you look and how you come across to others. And even though I spent the most amount of time in one place in California, it reminded me a lot of being the five years I spent in DC, which when I got to the end of that five year time, I knew it was time to leave. And I just knew I didn't want to settle down and raise a family there. And, and I thought that I could make everything happen in California that would work, but I, but I never felt at home there either and felt like I needed to come back to the Midwest to, to feel whole again. Yeah. Washington and LA are both one industry towns and that industry is the dog and everybody else is the, is the, is a, is a flea on the tail. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you're back in Wisconsin now you're back, you're back home. Yeah. Uh, that must feel pretty awesome. It does. I mean, I love driving on a road and not have a car on my tail. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, a, Tesla, I, a Tesla on your tail and the, yeah, like, the, no, the, the worst part about it wasn't just the Tesla on your tail. It was the motorcycles coming up uh, on your brine slide on the right split in the lane. And it was yeah. like, I, I can't believe I didn't hit one of them in 18 years, 17 years there. No, I just felt like it, it was, it, I tip my hat publicly to my friend, Mark Boaster, <laughs> Mark, Mark worked for the LA times for so long, 34 years and bless him. He rode from Ladera ranch where we, we both lived up to LA for like 11 years, five days a week. We're looking at five hours of commuting time. I don't know how he did it. That's, that's a lot of NPR right there. <laughs> Gosh, it, you know, like when, when I realized that it was time to go, um, Oh, can you hold on just a second, Ken? That we got a humidifier that just kicked in, and it's probably kind of creating some noise in the no, background. You're good. you're good. Am I okay? Yeah. Well, um, I remember being on the road, and I down by one of the main drags by our house, and I looked at it, and I said, "Geez, I feel like I'm right in the middle of the Indy 500," and I, I felt like I was literally in the infield of it because it was just like watching race cars go by. And then I also realized that it's such a car culture because people spend so many hours of their life in a car that it has to be really almost like a house. Because if you're spending four to five hours a day in your car, it's got to be like dry, uh, 
a lazy boy on wheels. You know, it's got to be so comfortable. Sure, sure. And I just realized that that wasn't what I wanted anymore. And I wasn't, I didn't want that for my kids either. And it was a great feeling of relief. And it was, you know, like I look back on it now and I think I'm, I'm happy that we moved. But I learned so much in the process that was really important. So I, I don't discount it at all. It's just like one of those things that's, you can probably relate to it. There's just like, it comes a time in your life when it's like, okay, that's now done and I've got to move on to the next thing. And that's where we got, so. Sure. Let me uh, put you on the spot. Uh, I usually okay. at this point ask somebody, ask, uh, ask them to recommend a book. So do you have a book you'd like to recommend? Preferably uh, something to do with photography? No, it doesn't have yeah. to be. Gosh, I would say James Pressfield's The War of Art is a really good book for photographers who are looking to make a transition away from maybe working for somebody else as an employee to becoming somebody who's self-employed. Um, no, that's um, perfect. That's, that's great. That's what I'm looking for. Yeah. And the, the other thing is, is as much as we might not like it to be so, I think we are in a business that is, we're in a sales business but we always were in one because when you got a job for a publication, you had to put together a portfolio and you had to summon the courage to get on the phone to go show your work to somebody that takes real commitment and courage and confidence. And then something happened after we got our jobs where we kind of went away from that and we stopped being that person who put our work together in a portfolio and, put on shoe leather and went out and made the calls. And now as a self-employed photographer and so many more of our former staffers and contract photographers are now self-employed photographers. They have to, they really have to be salespeople and the product that they're selling is photography, but it doesn't have to be like a dirty thing or a nasty thing or feel bad, but it just has to be that you have to understand that that's part of what you're doing. Yeah, I'm not any good at that either. I don't because I don't like people. What are you gonna do? <laughs> good thing you didn't wear your hoodie today, Mister Montana. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I I was wearing my hat out there. Keep the snow off my head. Yeah. Right. So thanks, Paul. We'll You're uh, welcome. I sure enjoy talking with you. And yeah, me too. Just keep doing that that great work, and hi to your lovely family. Yeah, you too. See you again. Ciao.